Thank you so much for coming. Um, well, before we begin, uh, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielo, Gabrielino Tongva uh, peoples. Sorry. This, uh, this acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist, live, and uphold their sacred relations across their lands. We also pay our respect to indigenous elders, past, present, and future, and to those who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Um, so uh, we are here to honor um, Professor Esther Chow's uh, legacy uh, and her work. And we um, have a couple of folks, a couple of presenters who are joining us um, uh, via Zoom. And we have four presenters here in person as well. All right, so um, I am very honored uh, to um, preside this uh, uh, session. Um, we are here to remember Professor Esther uh, Inga Ling Chao, who passed away earlier this year. Professor Chao has been such a significant part of the SWS, and I feel extremely um, honored to be part of this incredibly meaningful event. Like many sociology graduate students, I met Professor Chow through her work in my graduate classes as she was one of the few sociologists who pioneered the analysis of intersectionality of race, class, and gender in the lives of Asian American women. Mm -hmm. Then I had a great privilege working with her closely as well. Esther was incredibly generous. Uh, in fact, she was the reason why I had my name on my first book, because when my advisor, Christian E. Bose, uh, asked her to be a co-editor of an edited volume she was planning, Esther actually recommended me, um, who was then a grad student, um, because of my closeness to the project. Of course, Esther's boundless generosity is forever imprinted with the SWS Esther Chow and Mary Joyce Crean uh, scholarship and will be remembered through our scholarship recipients, some of whom are here to, with us. I remember Esther had a great sense of humor. She was <clears throat> incredibly strong and such a great joy to be with. So today we invited colleagues who knew Esther well and can share highlights about her trajectory as well as the, the scholarship or these. Um, because of the short time we have, uh, my introduction of each speaker will be very brief and each speaker will have about five minutes, uh, eight minutes. Um, and after each speaker's remarks, I will invite the audience members to share their own memories or comments or questions. All right, uh, we will, our first presenter is um, Mary Osirum. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Minya. I'd like to begin by expressing my thanks to Roberta and to Barrett for organizing this session, an important tribute to a feminist scholar activist, par excellence, the person who introduced me to SWS. There is so much that can be said about Esther and her many contributions that she made to our discipline in so many areas, in gender and development, race, class, and gender, research methods, theory, migration studies, and the family. Her over 100 publications, including, and I will only name a very, very few, Women, the Family and Policy, a Global Perspective, Race, Class and Gender, Common Bonds and Different Voices, Transforming Gender and Development in East Asia, 
Contours of Citizenship, Women, Diversity, and Practices of Citizenship. Esther was a phenomenal leader. Her leadership as co-president of RC32 in the International Sociological Association, her work as vice president of the Eastern Sociological Society and chair of the Asia and Asian American section of ASA. And needless to say, she won countless awards. Again, I will just name a few, a Fulbright New Century Scholars Award, the Jesse Bernard Award, and the Feminist Mentoring and Activist Awards from SWS. Esther played such a pivotal role in the development of so many of us as scholars, as activists, as teachers. And I'd like to talk very briefly about two sort of major aspects of this in my own life. One, my own benefiting, if you will, from Esther's mentorship even if that mentorship was actually quite informal. And secondly, to talk a bit about her contributions to the area of sociology very close to much of my own work, and that is gender and development. I first met Esther in 1991, just to date how ancient I am, when I had a job interview, believe it or not, at American University where she was a tenured full professor of sociology. Esther managed to stay in touch with me over the years. And a few years later, I was working with a group of sociology colleagues from both Bryn Mawr and Bard colleges. And we were examining the experiences we had as faculty members of color teaching sociology at predominantly white institutions. We were looking for a venue in which to present our work and wanted another colleague or two to join us. So I was thrilled when Esther agreed to join us and she suggested that we present at SWS at the summer meetings, believe it or not. And in fact, and this to me was the amazing part when I actually went back to look at this, those meetings were held in Los Angeles, and that was in 1994. So I feel like this is special in so many ways. We presented on a panel entitled Faculty Women of Color and Classroom Experiences, Issues of Race, Class, and Gender in the University. And I have to say, and I know that Mignon had already alluded to this, Esther had been working and writing about Asian American women and the interactions of race, class, and gender in their lives very early on, really, to be honest, before it even became such a critically important concept okay. in our discipline, intersectionality. Esther next invited me to participate in an SWS-sponsored panel at the UN's Fourth World Conference on Women, <laughs> excuse me, and the NGO forum that was held in Wairo, China in 1995. Here we explored the topic, shaping the feminist social agenda, global dialogue toward action. <laughs> I think I should have went for the water. Um, and it was wonderful to actually be a part of this panel with Esther and also Manisha Desai. And it is because of that invitation from Esther that I had the opportunity to also participate with a group of feminist activists of color from the United States in crafting a response to the Platform for Action way back in 1995. So that was again so special. For literally another 15 to 20 years, I had the privilege of participating in panels with Esther at several international conferences, contributing to one of her edited volumes and to a special issue of international sociology where she was guest editor. I was involved as some of my colleagues clearly are that are on this panel, both on Zoom and of course Mignon as well, in the ninth, I'm sorry about this, the ninth International Interdisciplinary Congress on Women in Seoul, Korea in 2005. And also the conference, Gender and Social Transformation global, transnational, and local realities and perspectives in 2009 in Beijing, China. 
Again, I have to say that it is because of Esther that I actually knew about those opportunities and had a chance to participate. So I'd like to just take a few moments to talk about some of her major contributions to the field of gender and development. Esther was one of the major scholars who led the way in understanding the current phase of globalization as a gendered process. She recognized that gender is embodied in the very logic of globalization, in the processes and in the structures. She made sure that sociologists, social scientists, and a broader public were aware that the development of a global system provided differential access to women and men of society's resources and certainly of power, even when we were doing this work as recently as the early 21st century. It was still the case that certainly resources still rested very largely in the control of men. While Esther's contributions to feminist political economy here are quite strong and really expanded my own scholarship in this area, much of her theoretical work emerged from her years of field work, the work she did in China, looking at internal migration, gender, as well as issues of family, community, and economy. In fact, by centering gender in the emergence um, in her work, she actually demonstrated how women played such a pivotal role in the emergence of East Asian society's economic success. Esther remained committed to pursuing research questions that led to transformative scholarship. In addition for her, the integration of theory Research and praxis was central in her work and in her daily life. She established the True Light Foundation, an organization committed to reducing poverty and expanding educational opportunities for children in rural China. But one of the memories that really sticks out for me of Esther, and again, Mignon and some of our other colleagues, I think will remember some of this quite well, was when we were at this ninth international interdisciplinary conference on women in Seoul. And every day we had to literally walk up a very, very steep hill. And at that point, I have to tell you, I mean, I felt like I was barely making the steep hill, but Esther, who had already, to be honest, had been experiencing some significant health challenges, didn't want us to wait back and walk up the hill with us. She would keep saying, just go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll be there, I'll catch up. Tremendous strength, tremendous resilience. And that's again, what she kept with her and the ways in which she inspired her students and her mentees. I will miss the many, many opportunities I have to say to catch up with Esther over a meal at meetings such as this one. But most of all, I miss her friendship. Thank you so much, Esther, for the privilege of having you in my life. And a special thanks to her family for sharing her with us. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> really brings a lot of memories. <laughs> Um, our second presenter is um, on Zoom, uh, Professor Josephine Bakubetz uh, from Florida Atlantic University. Josephine. Thank you, Mignon. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, it's a privilege for me to have this opportunity to present a tribute in memory of the scholarship and professional legacy of my late sister colleague and friend, um, Esther Nanming Chow. Let me start by extending my deepest sympathy to Esther's husband, Norm, and their family on their loss, which is also our loss. Um, may she rest in peace. Esther was among a group of sister colleagues of color with whom I spent dedicated time at annual SWS and ISA meetings as far back as 20 years ago. We often had dinner as a group or on a one-on-one -on -one when we, over coffee or lunch, when we had time to catch up with each other. But during those times, we would discuss each other's work, family lives, 
share our thoughts about current affairs of the day of concern to us and things as and issues as women of color or as transnational feminist scholars and activists um, that were of that we felt were important to discuss and we wanted to share that time together. We often attended each other's panel sessions at these conferences to give support and lend voice to the issues being addressed and of interest to us in those sessions. Those were good times and good memories that have continued over the years and that we will treasure throughout life's journey. As my own time is brief and know that other colleagues will speak to other aspects of Esther's um, legacy, I'll focus my comments on my interactions and memories of Esther as co-president with um, Margaret Abraham of um, RC32, um, um, the Research Committee 32, Women, Gender and Society of the International Sociological Association. Both Esther and Maggie were instrumental in encouraging me to join ISA, I would say around 2005 and in time to serve in various capacities, um, such as the Africa Regional Representative, co-president of RC32 and ISA Nominations Committee member. I also had the good fortune to attend an international conference organized by Esther and Tan Ling in Beijing, China in 2009, and we'll speak to that as well. Esther and Maggie were elected co-presidents of RC32 and of ISA. I, it was from 2006 to 2010. And a key objective of their co-presidency was to create a more representative and inclusive RC32 board and membership, especially underrepresented regions in the global South, Africa and the Middle East being the least represented. And poor representation from the global south was mainly due to lack of financial support um, to fund these trips. It was around this time that Esther and Maggie approached Akoswa Dumakwampofo of the University of Ghana and I to join and support them in the recruitment of more African scholars to join RC32 and to collaborate with them and the RC32 board in discussions on possible funding sources, such as travel grants, registration grants through ISC, RC32 funds, as well as soliciting support from ASA, SWS, and other organizations. I recall that the um, RC32 reception at the first ISC World Forum, which was held in Barcelona, Spain, um, was funded in collaboration with SWS. Over the years, SWS and other professional organizations, uh, is, for example, in Europe, have continued to collaborate with RC32 in a similar manner during the ISA World Forum or World Congress. To effectively connect RC32 members globally and to increase membership participation in advancing the goals of RC32, um, Esther and Maggie set up a listserv, which is still in operation, has been expanded in other ways now. Um, other accomplishments within their term of office, um, looking at their own, the goals that they established when they assumed office, were to promote scientific cooperation and exchange with other professional organizations inside and outside ISA, research collaboration among members, and fostering an atmosphere that valued feminist praxis. And to this end, and with the active engagement of the RC32 board, um, which represented different regions of the world, um, various independent or joint sessions were typically organized in collaboration with other organizations at ISC meetings and vice versa. Um, for example, I remember in 2007, I remember a panel session organized by Bandana, Pokaisa, Solange, Simos, and Olutola Pierce on linking the global and the local for social change at the annual ASA meeting in New York. Also as co-presidents, Esther and Maggie co-organized a panel session on gender and work, global, local, and transnational perspectives at the 2008 annual ASA meeting in Boston. And under their co-presidency and in collaboration with um, Evie Tasoglu of St. Mary's University in Canada, and the EKKE, the National Center for Social Research in Greece, the first RC32 conference was held in um, 
Athens, Greece. Um, and yeah, and this was one of the forums that um, I, um, RC32 began to participate in. So the co-presidency of RC32 by Esther and Maggie was most significant for me. Their enthusiasm, their dedication, their vision for RC32 at the time inspired me to become more engaged as a member of ISA and RC32. They were often willing to read, comment on papers. I and others were preparing for publication. They were always available to provide advice for those of us who later assumed elected leadership roles in RC32 and ISA. Befittingly, their co-presidency culminated in a co-edited book with Laura Maratu, Ali Pranti, and Evangelina um, Tassoglu um, called entitled Contours of Citizenship, Women, Diversity, and Practices of Citizenship, which was published by Ashgate in 2010. Um, finally, I'd like to make some comments about the international conference that um, Mary mentioned the gender and social transformation, global, transnational, and local realities and perspective. And this was organized by Esther and Tan Lin in Beijing in July 2009. Um, I was invited among other SWSs to attend this conference. Um, and I remember some of the SWSs I can remember who were there is um, uh, Mary Osirim, um, Judith Lorba, Myra Max Paré. Um, and then there were other sociologists also, Sylvia Walby, um, Peggy Levitt, the late Anne Dennis, Marilyn Porter. There were over 200 conference participants. And this conference centered around questions of how women and gender relations are shaped by societal transformation, economically, politically, socially, and culturally in the global transnational and local context and processes. And a key point of emphasis was how, and I quote, theory and research on women and gender informed public debates, policy and praxis, contributed to empirically grounded research, advanced feminist scholarship, inspired collective action by empowering women as well as men locally, transnationally and globally. And keynote papers were informed, as Mary was saying, by critical debates at that time on globalization, transnationalism, intersectionality. I remember that a lot, the discussions around intersectionality and gender equality. And then they also made sure that there were two plenary sessions focused on then current developments in gender scholarship in China. And it was a wonderful opportunity to share and exchange knowledge and research experiences with colleagues from across the globe who had similar interests on gender and globalization, intersectionality, transnationalism, and so on. And the study of globalization as a gendered phenomenon and ways in which it shapes social institutions differentially impacts men and women's access to and control over resources, values, identities, power relations, was a key component of Esther's body of scholarship her teaching and her activism. And I am glad that she had the opportunity to showcase her work and that of many other colleagues from across the globe in this field of the discipline in China, a country of origin. Um, I remember after the conference, I was not able to attend that, but I think she took some of the, I think um, people like Judith Lorber, Myra Max Ferre, they all, they, she took them to the village that she had been doing this project, a community project, um, to see what you know, she had done there. Esther will be sorely missed, but her legacy as a scholar, teacher, mentor, activist, and friend will live on. May she rest in peace. Thank you. I should wait probably until the end. But I cannot help but thinking what an incredible scholar um, person. Um, thank you, Josephine. Um, our next presenter uh, is Professor Bendana Perkayasta from the University of Connecticut. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen, so give me a second. 
Yes. So I'm really glad that I'm going after Mary Oseram and Josephine Bucobetz because they've been along with Esther among the sisters of color on whom I have relied so thoroughly and for so long. Um, I wish to thank uh, certainly SWS for organizing this session. Roberta Barrett, special thanks to you. Min Jeong for presiding over this session and to all of Esther's family members. I don't think I can ever adequately explain how her legacy lives on, but I'm going to try and talk about two points with the hope that you get a sense of what Esther meant to us. So on this slide, I put up a really you know, personal choice of Esther's many, many publications, because these, I think more than anything else, shaped my life a great deal. I actually began my career as a sociologist with a joint appointment in sociology and Asian American studies in 99, when Asian American studies was a kind of unique thing in the US and people would often ask me, what is that, that all about? <laughs> so I was really, really grateful as I was coming up towards my job at the turn of the 21st century to find that in 1987, Esther had published something which actually had the term Asian American women you know, as an article that I could refer to, that I could say, look, there are other people who've done this work. But I think what was very critical to my development and thinking was also Esther's work in this absolutely fantastic collection. That's why I put up the cover of the book, Women of Color in US Society, edited by Maxine Backer Zinn and Bonnie Thornton Dill. In it, Esther wrote about Asian American women at work. While in 87, she was wondering in that article in Gender and Society, what would it take for Asian American women to develop a feminist consciousness? By the time she wrote in this, this 1994 chapter, she was actually laying out all of the structural factors that acted as major barriers to the advancement of Asian American women. Esther, of course, was one of the chief authors in one other collection that was invited by Christine Bose when she was editor, and that was on the scholarship, gender scholarship in China. I didn't list it here, but I feel that people might have better access to it. So at the corner of the slide, I also put in the years when SWS's leadership began to be taken over by women of color. 2005, Marlies Durr becomes the first woman of color to become president. Then 2007, Manisha Desai, 2013, it was me. And from 2018 onwards, we've had a galaxy of people. We've had Adia Wingfield, we've had Josephine Bucobetz, we have Roberta Villion, and then of course, Mary Osram is coming in. So there has always been this synergy about the scholarship, naming groups, and then what happens as part of the organization transformation. So I think one key legacy that Esther has created so strongly was to name a group, Asian American in 1987, when actually at that time, South Asians weren't even part of the group, but that's neither here nor there. She named it, she opened the space for the scholarship, and then we moved along. I'm going to come back to Christine Bose's presidency in 2006 in just a minute, but along with Esther's work, this early work and Margaret Abramson's early work on violence against South Asian women, those two were certainly pillars in my development and the development of a lot of people who identify as Asian Americans. Now, here is the other part of the legacy. I know that Mary and uh, Josephine have talked about Esther's many 
publication, so I thought I should talk about this. In 2006, when Christine Bose organized her SWS meeting in San Juan, we were, yes, we were actually in Puerto Rico. We heard from a galaxy of local scholars, local practitioners during that time. But it was at that meeting when Margaret Anderson came on behalf of American Sociological Association and asked SWS if they would contribute a very significant sum of money towards the minority fellowships. And members generally agreed that was a good thing to do and we have been contributing since then. But it was also at that meeting that this discussion came up about the Chow Green Award and how should it be named. That meeting was unfortunately or fairly contentious. A lot of people felt that the, the award should not be named. Um, you know, for people who were still alive. And I remember that at the end of the first discussion, sitting in a corridor with Esther and Esther in tears, because it was her name on that award and that discussion was very unpalatable to her. And I decided to mention this because the legacy is not those tears. The legacy is also not the private conversations I've had with Esther about the naming of the award and what happened later at all. But I think what her legacy was that within a very short time, she told me that as feminists, we have to get beyond our identity politics, stand up for what is right and move along so that the organization endures. And she indeed, I don't know who made the first moves, but there was a general reconciliation of the people who didn't want the award named this way. And as you all know, the award is named partly after her, so that happened. And, and she remained very good friends with the people who were part of the dissenting camp at that point, reminding the rest of us that the feminist journey includes this ability to rise above particular moments, hold on to the values that are important and need to be held on to, but keep moving forward so that the entire organization moves. So with that, I think I'm going to end my two major, you know, ideas about what I think are Esther's legacies but I want to add this, that this idea that you need to make space and the idea that is you need to make space, be able to weather some of the debates and the dissensions, but come out at the end as stronger people, people who genuinely care about each other are the kind of legacy that I always associate with Esther. I always see Esther is hurrying along. She was a dynamo of energy, even when she was quite sick. I, I somehow still feel when she was very sick, she still moved at a pace that was quite fast. I just hope that while she rests in peace, somewhere that energy that she generated, that dynamism that she generated continues to reverberate in our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vandana. Um, I really, really appreciate uh, these presenters really uh, highlighting uh, and discuss different aspects of her work, uh, Esther's work. Um, even though they all connect, they are connected, intersected, but um, but also um, especially those who may not be familiar with um, her work, everything she did. Um, I think this was really great. Um, thank you so much. And <laughs> I think uh, everyone has kind of similar <laughs> uh, memory of her, uh, especially in Seoul and Beijing when she was still battling uh, and she was still walking, um, you know, uh, which shows her perseverance, uh, commitment, 
um, to uh, feminist scholarship and activism. Um, I don't know, I will, uh, I think they always are connected in my memory, at least. Um, thank you so much. Now, we have three presenters um, who are uh, Child Green awardees. Um, our first uh, presenter is Veronica Montes uh, from Brimar College. Wow. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, this has been very emotional. <laughs> so um, first, um, I would like to thank Roberta for the invitation to be part of this panel. I never imagined it's gonna be too, too intense <laughs> when I was thinking about what I'm gonna be saying. Uh, secondly, uh, let me extend my condolence to Esther family uh, for the loss. You know, I I prepared something, but uh, I, you know, by being here and listening to each other and by sharing all these memories, um, I'm gonna change <laughs> what I wanna what I wanted to say. But um, I think, you know, we we keep saying one of the reasons why we we continue or we would like to be here in uh, SWS, and I think this is showing us why, because here we see this uh, group of women, women of color, that have been coming here every single year you know, like for over, I don't know how many years already, but, uh, and that's the reason why many of us keep also coming, come returning every single year as well. Um, and also I was thinking about, you know, like uh, in now the Josephine, Bandana and Mary were sharing, you know, like the different ways in which, you know, like their friendship with uh, Esther and also different ways, you know, like, you know, like collaborating. I think that's, uh, I was just thinking that would be great to, I mean, to do something in terms of like um, highlight, you know, the wonderful work that every one of you have been done and hopefully not waiting until they are not here with us. So I think, so that would be something for us to acknowledge and recognize your work here and celebrate your work in present. But, um, you know, I think also we're thinking in terms of the, you know, the legacy. Sometimes we don't even recognize the legacy in terms of, I mean, we see it in, in, in concrete terms, right? Or the work that the, the, the stir in this case um, has been, you know, she wrote many books and articles, but sometimes there are some, you know, legacies that are no tangible. And I think for me, that's what I wanted to focus my, my talk. Her present. Uh, I remember the first time when I met Stir. It was in 2010. It was in uh, Santa Barbara, in the winter meeting. Um, it was my first winter meeting, and I was there not because I I went, but I was in Santa Barbara, <laughs> so it was no other choice for me. And also because it was part of a, I was part of the programming committee. At that time, so uh, Denise Seguro was the president. So she obviously, so as part of the in the department, in the security department, so we were like being part of that uh, programming committee. I didn't, I didn't know anything about what was, you know, like the implications, how to put together a program. So I was there, and I was really, 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 really nervous. I didn't attend any of the panels because I was so intimidated to participate in that meeting. And I remember that I was looking through the program and I saw sister to sister and I was reading the description and I was like, mm, probably that's the place. <laughs> Where should I go? <laughs> I remember I went and I entered, I, I got there uh, a little bit late <laughs> and um, Esther was, was there and she was, she was uh, talking about her experience, what it was like to be in, in the academia as a woman of color. And I remember when she started like, talking about how difficult sometimes the obstacles, you know, especially being an immigrant woman, women of color with accent. As soon as she started like, saying with accent, I was like, wow, that resonates with me. 
And I start feeling like, wow, this is something, something they never imagined I'm gonna be able to listen to, right? And in that, that particular environment. So I felt so, you know, like I felt that that's the space where I can be who I am. And at that place also, I remember Carrie Acosta was there also talking about her experience. And I think for me, it was the moment in which I realized that there could be a space where I can go and feel they can be in community. So I remember the next year I applied for the, uh, at that time it was called uh, Women of Color Scholarship and I got it. So I think for me, it was, you know, so significant because it was a validation for what I was doing in terms of focus, my focus on what I was studying at that time, you know, like uh, the life of immigrant women, Mexican immigrant women, but also validation for who I am, you know, like as a researcher. And I remember, you know, like every single summer when I, you know, from, from that time, I, 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 have, I, 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 I haven't missed any SWS <laughs> since then. You know, because I really, I think I am very thankful, you know, because of that opportunity. And I remember that, uh, you know, in every, every one of those meetings seen in Easter and be part of a, you know, along with the other group of women of color. One of the regrets I think I have right now is that I never told her how important it was, you know, that day when I listened to her when I listen to her experience, especially because I would, would love to say that thank you because when she said that it was possible, you know, to be in the academia, even though with, you know, like with all those, what we think it could be seen as, you know, like shortcomings, it's our strength. And she made me feel, you know, like that I can be part of this space. So, I see in that sense, uh, for me, it changed in many aspects, the way I feel, you know, in this space. And I think this is the reason why I feel that this is also home for me. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, that's a, such a, great phrase she made yeah this place is our home mm -hmm. and yeah I always say that too as <laughs> always is my home <laughs> um professionally um and definitely uh everyone here um um but also Esther made that um for us thank you um our next presenter is Christina Fullerton Rico uh, from University of Wisconsin Medicine sorry Hey, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. I never got the chance to meet Esther personally, but I'm very inspired by her generosity with um, early career scholars, her research, and her commitment to use her research to make a material difference on the problems she studied, as well as um, her work to make sure that women of color are able to complete their research and develop their academic careers. And I'm really honored to be here and discuss the impact that Esther Chow's commitment to supporting feminist sociologists early in their careers has had on my life. Last year, I received an honorable mention for the Chow Green Scholarship. And this, <laughs> thank you. And this award was incredibly encouraging for me. Um, first of all, it was the only time that I've been in an academic space um, where they said, you can invite your family <laughs> to watch you on <laughs> Zoom. And I got to have my family who's in Chihuahua, Mexico. 
um, on the on the award ceremony with me, and it meant so much that they could be a part of my life in this way because sometimes it feels like academia is just a very rarefied space and everything has um, application fees and you have to have credentials and so that meant a lot to me. Um, but it also meant that my dissertation research on how undocumented immigration status complicates aging and how unauthorized immigrants and their transnational families confront these challenges seemed interesting and worthwhile to people I really admired. And so I, at the time, was really worried about how I could do this research, um, given that I we were we are in a pandemic and it's a high risk population. But I thought, okay, I have to do this and I have to report back to SWS. And I felt like the confidence of the Chow Green Award Committee meant that I could overcome the challenges. So I'm still very much in the middle of my research. I'm doing field work in New York and I'm getting ready to do field work in central Mexico. But I'd like to share some field notes to give you a sense of what I'm finding. And I do research in Spanish, um, but I've translated the quotes and I use pseudonyms in my writing. So I hope it's okay that I share. Doña Laura wears her silver hair in a short haircut and she wears clear acrylic glasses with rhinestones at the corner. On the day we talk in the apartment she shares with her daughter Marisol, she wears mascara, eyeliner, and plum lipstick. I'm meeting her for the first time today. And my first thought is that she's not the me abuelita I was expecting. <laughs> On Wednesday, after 25 years in New York, She's flying back to her hometown because she lacks papeles or papers. And so it's unclear whether she'll ever be able to return to the US. The 11 year old grandson she has helped raise is flying back to Mexico with her. He'll stay with her for a month and then fly back before school starts in New York. How did you decide that he would go with you? I ask. Doña Laura shakes her head. We didn't decide. He was the one who said, yo te voy a acompañar. I'm going to go with you. Marisol nods. It was his idea. They agreed that he could go even though he's never been away from his mom for longer than a week because Doña Laura knows him so well. I know all of his likes and dislikes, what he eats, what he really doesn't like, so I know he'll be okay with me. Marisol smiles, explaining that her son is so close to her mother, it's like they're best friends. I asked Doña Laura if she always planned to return, and she nods. Yes, I always wanted to go back. I wanted to go back before my mom died, but her voice breaks and the sentence hangs in the air unfinished. She cries for a couple of minutes while I say, lo siento feeling useless with my N95 mask and sitting the requisite six feet away. She started thinking about going back to Mexico more seriously when her knees and joints started hurting so much that the pain interfered with her ability to work. By this point, she had worked her way up from the factory floor to a clothing brand studio in the garment district where she was in charge of making samples. She loved that job because she was in charge of her own time and she could make herself coffee whenever she wanted. <laughs> Still feeling her bodily limitations, she started to look for a different way to make money. In her neighborhood, she joined a multi-level marketing company and started selling vitamins and supplements. At around the same time, she was diagnosed with osteoarthritis, which explained why she had been having pain and difficulty standing for long periods of time. She liked selling vitamins and supplements. And she says before the pandemic, she was making as much money as she had when she worked making clothes. But when the pandemic started, I began to feel more responsibility. Before I went to customers' houses or they came here, but after the pandemic started, I couldn't just go or have people come here because I might get sick 
and I was endangering my daughter and grandson. So I made the decision to stop working and take care of the house and my family was supportive. Marisol nods. But her retirement has had a cascading effect. She says, I'm just not comfortable here anymore. Everyone's working and I'm just sitting at home. When it's winter, she can't go out because it's too cold. When it's summer, it's too hot. She used to like going to the park, but now on top of the osteoarthritis, she's developed a lot of allergies. And the last time she sat in the grass, her legs filled up with hives. Her rheumatologist told her there's no cure for osteoarthritis, which made returning to Mexico feel more urgent. I want to go back while I can still walk. Still, most of her family is here. And when I ask her what she hopes to do in the future, she says, I still have the hope that I can get a visa once I'm there so that she can come back to visit. Doña Laura migrated to New York before her daughter Marisol. And she wonders if maybe Marisol can also follow her on this migration. Maybe, she thinks, Marisol and her grandson can also move to Mexico and they can find a way to get by and give her grandson a good education there. Marisol looks at the ground and softly shakes her head no. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your great work. <laughs> Fill the notes. Um, as I'm listening to it, I feel like, oh, um, through the scholarship, uh, Esther is part of so many um, projects, including yours. Uh, hope I hope it's okay for me to say, um, but I feel like, yeah, she's gonna be part of so many different projects um, because of this legacy. Uh, and it's a great, um, um, feeling to have um, for us. Um, all right, so our last but not least uh, presenter is Jennifer James from UC San Francisco. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? I heard tell with masks and all this stuff. Um, it's such an honor to be here today. It's been a wonderful opportunity to learn more about Professor Chow as a scholar and an activist and a colleague and a mentor and a friend. Um, it's really been a privilege to listen to the other presentations. I'm so glad to be here. So I um, received the Chow Green Award nine years ago. Which <laughs> That just feels impossible. I'm like, but I'm so young. How could that be so? It feels like both longer and shorter at the same time. Um, I was just at the beginning of my dissertation work. I'd never attended SWS before. I'd never attended ASA before. I think I gave my first presentation, one of my first academic presentations at SWS this year. I think maybe one person attended. <laughs> it was like about 8 a.m. on the last day of the conference. <laughs> Um, so it, I was very new to this world, and um, I think in a lot of ways I had an affliction that I think a lot of graduate student had where I thought I was the only person who was doing radical work this way, and like nobody could understand me, I, you know, I'm doing research in my own way, and of course that's, that's not true, I was building on a legacy of many folks doing research, um, including and especially Professor Chow's decades of feminist and intersectional work that demonstrates that there was, um, this was a thing that sociologists were able to do. But as a, a budding feminist researcher who was on a medical science campus, um, I didn't I didn't see that. I didn't see other people doing that. And in the year or so prior to this, I'd attended some cancer meetings and, you know, I was taught, I, my, my research, my dissertation was on experiences of cancer, telling people, you know, that my dissertation is focused on Black women, I'm using Black feminist theory and intersectionality, and, and sort of the response, I was like, well, so of course you must be comparing Black women to white women. Like, that's what research on this topic is, and um, people didn't know what to make of the fact that I had a Black feminist approach to my research, um, and I was so insecure, and I, I really thought that maybe my research questions were not what I thought they were. Like, I thought they were important, but would anyone else think so? Um, and so winning the Chow Green Award was, I mean, first it was just shocking to me. I was like, what, how is this possible? Um, I haven't gone back recently and, and looked at my application materials because I think that would be horrifying to look back at your writing from a decade ago. 
Um, but I know that I was very authentic and honest about who I was and why I wanted to do this project. And prior to this award, I had unsuccessfully applied, I think maybe twice for the Minority Fellowship Program. And through those applications, I remember distinctly taking feedback from well-meaning mentors who I think really encouraged me to steer away from being feminist, from centering myself and my work and my approach. Um, and in this, you know, I really thought about what's my story, who am I? Um, and winning the award based on doing that made me feel like, okay, I can be unapologetically feminist and critical and anti-racist and intersectional in my work. And like, be a real sociologist, right? <laughs> So that's, I mean, it's just amazing. And, you know, I have such a distinct memory actually of, of, of Professor Chow coming up and congratulating me at the reception when it was announced I was the winner. And I was thinking in my mind, I was like, I think there were like spotlights and flashbulbs, but that feels unrealistic. And while people were talking, I was like, do I have a picture? And I just went and looked, which I didn't unfortunately think to have like slides made up, but I just wanted to show like, it really was kind of, I don't know if folks can see that. <laughs> there were like spotlights and flashes. And I feel like Professor Chow really looks like a, you know, feminist scholar, rock star. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I get to meet you. And that's really, I'm happy to share that photo in a way that people can actually see it after if folks want to see it. Um, and it just, it, it was really, it was a little bit like a surreal honor as a young scholar to meet someone so important who was interested in hearing about my work and like treated me as if I had important things to say, which was so lovely and generous of her to do. Um, I also want to mention I had the privilege of reviewing the child for Chow Green last year, including Christina's excellent application. Um, and I was struck by just how phenomenal these applications were and really feeling like I would not have gotten this <laughs> application. The bar has been so raised. And, you know, these are just brilliant early career scholars who are doing radical and important work to understand narratives and stories and the lives of people that have been understudied or been studied from a very different vantage point from a long time. And they really beautifully weave their own histories and their own positionalities and both their motivations for their work and their approach to their work in a way that I feel like even 10, 15, 20 years ago was discouraged and speaks, I think, to the legacy of this award and encourage, encouraging scholars to do um, work that way. So nine years later, <laughs> somehow, um, you know, I have been so fortunate to now win many, many funding awards and, and awards recognizing my work, which has been such a privilege. And this really feels like it was, it was the start of that. I am a primarily soft money funded researcher. So I'm supported on, or at the moment, like way too many grants, like a dozen grants, which is too many. Don't do that. <laughs> Early career scholars, smaller, bigger grants, but fewer of them is the way to go. But anyway, I think this award taught me that I can really do the work I want to do be the type of researcher I want to be, and I can find people to fund that work. Um, I still have received discouragement, even now, as you know, as an assistant professor, as a faculty member, from mentors who say, "Stick with LC, stick with this. This is what's funded. Like you can't do community-based work. You can't say you're doing advocacy and activism in your scholarship. You can't say you have a feminist leaning because that's biased." And I'm just kind of like, "Well, no," <laughs> and I ignore that advice. Um, and, and it's worked and it's great to be able to tell my mentees, like you can sort of unapologetically say, this is what I want to do, learn to write about it really, really effectively and well and cite the scholars who have evidence of it, but this is a thing that can be done. Um, over the last several years, my research for a long time was focused on experiences of cancer, and it still is to some extent. I'm doing a lot of research now focused on experiences of women who are incarcerated. I do that work in partnership with women who are currently and formerly incarcerated. Um, and it's explicitly activist. It's, it's my aim is to influence policy. My aim is to partner with community to understand problems. Um, and that's not something that when I started graduate school, I thought I could truly do. So I, I feel just so grateful for this, to be a part of this, this legacy. And, you know, I'm thankful for this award that was given to, I think, a very insecure, imposter syndrome filled, which I kind of still am, but imposter syndrome filled kid. I was 27, I was not a kid, but it feels like I was a kid at the time. Um, you know, it gave me just like the smidgen of confidence I needed to pursue scholarship grounded in feminism and intersectionality. That's really been the driver of my research ever since. So thank you all so much. And, and thank you to, to, to Professor Chow and to her family. Um, 
it's it's such an honor to be able to to speak to that legacy and be a part of this tradition that she was so instrumental in developing. So, thanks. That was such a great <laughs> last of, um, uh, presentation, um, unapologetically uh, feminist. Um, I think uh, that was that's the spirit of SWS, and also that was uh, what Esther uh, was um, uh, telling us, teaching us as well. So thank you so much. <laughs> um, so I am going to now uh, open up to the floor. Uh, if uh, anyone wants to share their own uh, remarks or uh, accounts, Myra. <laughs> yes, uh, Myra Marks Ferry. Um, I've been a lot, I was a longtime friend of Esther's. Um, it's still hard to wrap my head around the fact that she's gone. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to add a reflection on was Bandana's point about it was controversial to name the award for Esther Chow and Mary Joyce Green. I don't want to see Mary Joyce get lost in this discussion of Esther. Uh, but part of the reason it was controversial is the Social Action Award had been named for Pauline Bart, who then basically repudiated a lot of SWS stuff. Um, and then it was very difficult to sort of, how do you have an award named for Pauline Bart when she thinks that basically naming the award for her means she makes the rules for the award. And we were never faced with that kind of problem with Esther uh, or with Mary Joyce's legacy as well. It was never a question of, this is my award, I'm going to direct it. Um, but that was the question about being a live person named for it. But Marlies Durr, who made the argument that carried the day um, at that time, and Bandana rightly notes that Marlies was also the first woman of color president of SWS, and she was the one who introduced this motion to name it for Mary Joyce and Esther. And she said very effectively to everyone with or without reservations about naming it um, this way is within the black community, we feel very strongly that you give the flowers before the funeral. Uh, you make sure that people understand that they are appreciated and you don't wait until they're dead to then give the flowers, the kudos, the whatever. And that's what really carried the day. And yet I have to say that listening to these uh, very interesting talks, that in many ways the flowers went the other way. That is to say by naming it for Esther, Esther was able to be more of a model of what the award could be. Not that she tried to control it, not that she thought it was hers to give, not that she, I don't know, changed the award to be heard, but rather that by embodying the award and by bringing all of her research expertise uh, to credentializing the award and being able to go and get the flashbulbs popped and shake the hand of the awardees and things like that was a way of helping Esther be in fact a continuing influence. Um, so it wasn't just giving flowers before the funeral. It was really empowering Esther's strong modeling of what SWS can be and should be. Uh, and that empowerment, as you can see, really paid off. And so I wanna thank Marlise for having made that argument and carried the day and gotten the award named that way. Um, and I also really appreciate the fact that people were talking about all the ways in which Esther's work was both about Asian American women who have been here for a long time. And she did a lot of work with Kate Burhide about work 
and the structure of the economy and the ways in which women of color in the American economy were positioned and really had a very work focused kind of thing about the US. But she was never ever divorced from the question of immigration and never ever divorced from the question about women in China and why Asian American women should care about women in China. That it wasn't just women who were of Asian descent or Chinese specific descent who should care about women in China, but that we all SWSers, ASA people should care about women in China. And so she organized this conference that was mentioned jointly with the association, the All China Women's Federation. And SWS was sort of the set up as a delegation to represent the all American. Uh, it was not a oh, yes, I'm going to pick out the Asian American sociologists to bring to China to talk to the Chinese sociologists. It was, I'm going to bring American sociologists who have something to say and who have some interest in and can develop more interest in women in China uh, and really build between the two countries, between the two populations, between the two sets of sociologies, um, more of a connection. And I always think that that's really important too, because I think it's a way in which Esther widened the sense of who can and should be interested in global feminism, not just women of color in the United States or the category women of color who are immigrants who connect this country and some other country, much as it is valuable to have those connections, but also just to say, it's a whole world out there, folks. Um, and looking at the Green Tide banner, you know, it's a whole world out there from which we can learn a ton of stuff. Um, and, and so I think Esther would be very pleased to have that Green Tide banner there um, to, to underline the fact that this is a global question about gender and society, about sociologists for women in society, not in American society, but in society. Thank you, Myra. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, thank you so much for articulating how, you know, our Esther uh, really embraced all um, uh, feminists and, uh, worked with uh, across the you know boundaries and um, uh, across different groups. Um, thank you. And anyone? Um, Tracy Orr. Um, I just wanted to add. I didn't work with um, Esther in. Um, academic sense, um, but I, she was probably the first person who I felt really welcomed me into this organization. She didn't, and I remember that Santa Barbara meeting, and I remember um, not always feeling included in this organization when I first joined, and Esther didn't care about what institution I went to, what research I did, whatever, she just saw me as another human and welcomed me. And then uh, that Santa Barbara meeting, though, I don't know if you remember, Veronica, when um, she helped us raise money by, um, you could hug Esther, for, for a buck, yes. And so I have, I have photos of that moment. Um, and I was the one with the flash taking your picture when you got that award too. So, um, but she had a, an amazing sense of humor and was just a good human who welcomed us. But yeah, hug Esther for a buck. I know she, I mean, her sense of humor was really great. You know, I'm going to remember her smile, but I'm also going to remember her giggles. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Hi, um, Esther. Um, it's also my name. <laughs> Um, and I want to say something about, and, and Hara and I were, were talking about this just now. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for organizing this beautiful, beautiful panel. 
um, and to all of you for your comments. What we were talking about is the fact that um, having the honor of being one of the co-chairs of the Sister to Sister Committee, as Jennifer just mentioned, even though it's a lot of work for a couple of months, <laughs> it is a lot of work, it's so, it's such a beautiful experience because um, we see where the discipline is going. We see what Jennifer was just talking about, the fact that, um, and this is different in Latin America. I'm, I'm going to talk about that. The fact that being unapologetic about being anti-racist, feminist, intersectional, all this is being already assumed um, by the applicants and the kind of work that we're reading, that we're seeing is just out of this world. And Hara and I were joking about the fact that I mean, just what Jennifer said too. My reaction was like, yeah, that I would have never gotten that award like ever <laughs> if it was now, you know, like if I had applied now because the quality of the proposals and how clear they are about how intersectional they are and including not only, you know, the factors we usually think about when we think about intersectionality, but also the things that we're talking about here, right? So trans, you know, transnational, international, all that. Um, it's all of that is evident in in the proposals, and I'm so so thankful to all of you who have shared stories about my namesake <laughs> because I only met her online at one of the events we had for you know for the word and I was just like wait wait a minute is this is this the person that we always hear about and that we read about like she's so humble <laughs> you know um and she was so gracious with the RDs and with us at the committee and again it was a zoom event but still you could see a little bit just a little bit of, of everything you you just said um and I also want to thank you for you know what you just shared especially because that phrase about you know there's a whole world out there that's what I've been saying since I've been here in the U.S. <laughs> and and it's very frustrating for those of us who are originally from other places in the world, how the US and so many sociologists and other people, but I, I think it's a very big contradiction to do that when you're a sociologist, right? You're not being sociological about your own research and about yourself when you're just looking at your own country and assuming that everybody else is just a case right? I'm based in the U.S., therefore I have the right to study everybody else, but I'm not going to engage with them as equals, and I'm not going to engage with them beyond just being a place where I get my data from. And learning much more about how Esther was an example of that, I have to say, has made me very, very happy. <laughs> so thank you, and Thank you so much for this panel. And I just wanted to add how crucial the award is. I know that you know it, but I just wanted to ask, uh, I, sorry, I just wanted to add that every year since I've been in two, you know, uh, in several iterations of the award, you can see it in the quality of the applications and you can see it in how powerful and how beautiful the personal statements are. So, you know, her legacy continues. Erika Buse, uh, McAllister College. Uh, I wasn't planning on saying anything, but I just realized this is a funny thing about uh, Esther Charles' legacy, that because of that award, as a grad student myself with five other feminist scholars of color created a similar award for graduate students at our own institution with our own money. 
Um, no, there were some faculty who also participated, but it's as a result of this. And I, I saw her in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I didn't meet her, sadly, but I've heard everyone mentioning and pointing at her during that conference. But it's interesting how her legacy is not only the production of, that you are doing or the collaborations with the, her peers and you all who have share this, there are these other legacies. And I just realized here in you all, I said, wait a minute, we created this as a result of what it was here, right? It gave us the validation to say, hey, sociology department, we have this. There is this organization who also has that, why we don't have that. So thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say I didn't know who Esther Chow was, and I'm very happy to be here to learn more about her, because I think I'm someone who um, can often take for granted to be unapologetically feminist, to be unapologetically anti-racist, to do all of this work, um, and also that other countries outside of the U.S. matter. Of course, they do. My parents are from other countries, but, you know, I also have done field work and have been traveling due to different privileges and opportunities that I've had right very early in my life abroad. And so there are so many things that are at the center of my conception of how to do work and also how to live in the world that I often don't even really think about it so much. And so it's it matters to be reminded of who those specific people were to be able to do that. And that's also part of the legacy are the people who get to be, you know, like myself, so unapologetically so many things without even realizing, right, where the labor comes from. And so I'm happy to be here and learn more about her um, because yeah, I, I don't get to be this way for no reason. So thank you. Well, again, yeah, legacy continues. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your, uh, for sharing your story and your story. Um, which I really didn't know. Um, and of course, uh, thank you so much for everyone um, here listening to um, stories about our Esther. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I don't know if any presenters want to add anything else um, before we close. I just want to say one thing. Um, we talked a lot about the scholarship. We talked about her work. Uh, her publications, her conferences, um, and um, ISA, um, but uh, maybe relatively it's a small, but I do want to say that uh, I, I see a lot of you uh, who've been part of the international community of SWS as well, and Esther was the one who pulled me in to the international community, um, so I also want to mention that. <laughs> Um, I think uh, SWS is doing great work through international community. Um, so there's that. Thank you everybody for, for sharing all your memories and experiences. And I was thinking as you were speaking that we should probably create, um, and Barrett, I'm, uh, thinking of you in terms of how we can actually make this happen, but we should probably create a way where people can find on the on the website of SWS not just past you know uh, people who were part of uh, different leadership positions and their name and where it was the institution, but probably we should create a, a her story of what happened in this institution in a way that. Uh, goes beyond just having, uh, you know, eventual plenaries or or panels devoted to to remembering. And of course, like we shouldn't really wait until people are no longer with us. So um, I guess now that we, we can do this together, probably we can figure out a way where we can build this history or this history of uh, who's been involved in this organization and their work. Um, and so to, to gather it and put it together in a way that is not just a matter of people trying to figure out who was who and what they were doing, but as a way to acknowledge how all of their work have been building this space that we treasure so much and we should be able to sustain in the future. So I appreciate your contributions and 
will be calling on you to help us build this, this her story. But I think it's important that we uh, think about that for, for the future of the organization and to give the space to others who are not familiar with the organization, not familiar with the, with the work that so many uh, of us are doing and maybe like unapologetically, right? Like create this, this documentation because we shouldn't be really uh, waiting for people to find, to learn who people were so and, and how fundamental their work was to, to lead us to where we are today. Yes, I, I would like to say, yes, uh, that's something that I think we have been talking about in terms of like keeping the memory. I mean, this is part of, uh, you know, like all these legacies, but yes, as I said, you know, like no waiting until they are not here. So I think every year we can do something to kind of, uh, you know, like uh, bringing all that, uh, you know, like the, the sharing the experiences, you know, sharing the memories, sharing, you know, like the, the, the construction of the memory. So when it's still here, so I think that will be something, a, a beautiful project. And I, and especially because, you know, like many people are joining new people. So the, the, the organization has been growing. And I think for many people, they don't know about, you know, like uh, the different, you know, like uh, 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 people that, I mean, you know, like, yeah, the, the founders, and I think that would be important to 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 not only acknowledge, but also to, as uh, Christina mentioned, you know, like uh, acknowledging also like that we are like building upon those who were before us, and I think that's very 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 important. Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to read a comment from Susan Lee, who's a past chair of the International Committee. She said, I would like to echo Min Jung's words about Esther's commitment to the International Committee during the years that I was a member and then chair of the International Committee. Esther was a strong and passionate participant. She felt strongly, as many have said today, that SWS should care for women worldwide and not just in the U.S. And that's from Susan Lee. And I also wanted to just... Um, highlight our YouTube channel for SWS, which we'll be messaging out more about. I believe that there's a history of SWS that Esther participated in a plenary for, can't remember back how far, but it was a winter, the winter meeting 2021, I believe, that Esther participated in virtually, which was all held virtually. So you could take a look at the YouTube channel and find that to, to see Esther. Well, I think we can conclude. Thank you again so much, uh, Roberta and Barrett and the program committee for organizing this event. Um, and um, again, thank you so much for <laughs> inviting me to this. Uh, and also thank you um, our presenters um, and for sharing your stories. Um, I mean, just making this event much more uh, meaningful. I will remember this um, forever. Um, and of course, uh, thank you, Esther, um, for your uh, work and um, your lifelong commitment uh, to feminist scholarship uh, that um, paved our way. Um, may her rest in peace and power. Thank you. Thank you.